Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this Institution of Mechanical Engineers webinar. Uh, should be an interesting 40-minute presentation, I think, this morning from Sam. Um, just a few words. I'm the chair of this session. Uh, my name is David Pates, and I'm the engineering director at Marla Powertrain in Northampton in the UK, which is an engineering consultancy that uh, develops uh, highly efficient uh, powertrains, both uh, with internal combustion engines and electrified powertrains. So this session is uh, going to be about a variable compression ratio combustion development platform uh, for renewable fuels from uh, the company called Libertine. So Libertine has developed an opposed free piston development platform, which is now being used to demonstrate improved combustion with bioethanol, an energy dense low carbon biofuel. This development aims to show how a variable compression ratio cold start strategy can reduce misfiring under cold start conditions, a key challenge for renewable alcohol fuels such as bioethanol and emethanol. In this webinar, Sam Cockrell will describe the free piston motion control performance requirements, the technical innovations that allow Libertine's Intelligen platform to meet these requirements, and the validation of this performance through simulation and prototype testing. So we aim for this presentation to last between 30 and 40 minutes. Uh, hopefully it'll be about 20 minutes for a Q&A at the end. So uh, please feel free to submit your questions as we're going through the slides. Um, obviously we don't store them all up to the end. Um, there will be, there should be a attendee questions pod that you can type those questions into. Uh, and we'll, well, Sam will do his best to answer those at the end of the presentation. So Sam Cockerell is the uh, speaker, is the CEO of Libertine Free Piston Engines Limited, a UK startup developing free piston technology for distributed power and transport applications. Sam started his career at Cosworth in Northampton, next door to where I work, um, before forming Libertine in 2009, was a member of the senior management team of ENSYS one of Europe's major bioethanol producers. He's a chartered mechanical engineer and has an MBA from INSEAD. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Sam to uh, give you his presentation. David, thanks very much. Uh, so yes, I'm gonna be talking about our Intelligen platform, uh, what it does and how we'll be using that over the course of the coming weeks uh, to demonstrate better combustion using renewable fuels and in particular using alcohol. First up, uh, just a bit of background about Libertine. So as, as Dave mentioned, we're a startup. We develop, manufacture, and license a platform technology uh, which can be used in the development of engines for hybrid vehicles and for distributed power generation applications. Uh, our core technology focus is on the e-machines, uh, but also the power electronics and the motion control systems, which together allow this platform to crack one of the most difficult challenges for free piston engine programs, which is how do you control where the pistons are if you don't have a crankshaft? We've raised five million pounds to date. We're established uh, with a small development facility in Sheffield, um, and we're now starting to generate commercial traction. Uh, so I'm very interested to uh, provide a bit of visibility of, about our technology and what it does, uh, and looking forward to the Q&A session at the end. Firstly, just the simplistically, what a free piston engine is, and specifically what an opposed free piston engine is. So the opposed refers to the fact that we've got two pistons which are facing each other with an internal combustion chamber between them. Uh, now you can get opposed piston uh, can, can internal combustion engines with crankshafts, but in this case, uh, there are no crankshafts. Instead, there are two linear electrical machines which do two jobs. Firstly, they uh, capture the energy from combustion, they turn it into electrical power. And secondly, in the same operation, they also manage the position of the pistons in order that the combustion event, the compression ratio and the motion uh, profile during expansion and compression to make sure those are uh, fully optimized. You'll also notice at the ends of the uh, machine, there are two bounce chambers. Uh, and those are gas springs, which ensure that the pistons at the end of the expansion stroke uh, have some energy stored in the gas springs to push them back together again so the cycle can continue. Uh, and that cycle is a two-stroke cycle in this case. So uh, this uh, architecture is essentially a, a direct injection, uh, opposed piston, two-stroke, free piston engine. Uh, the detail is not much more complex than I've shown you on the previous slide. 
so here you can see a section through the platform which is on the test bench at the moment. You can see uh, on the top, uh, more or less at bottom dead center, uh, the pistons fully apart from each other allow scavenging, uh, uniflow scavenging of the combustion chamber between the inlet port on the left and the exhaust port on the right. Uh, you can also see the uh, direct injection uh, fuel position and the, uh, the spark points. There are four sparks on this particular engine. Uh, I think I can probably show you a, a cutaway animation of this running. Let's see if this will uh, play for us. I might have to click forward again. There we go. So in this animation, uh, you can see the reciprocation back and forth of those two free piston movers. Uh, right at the bottom of the stroke, the inlet and the exhaust ports are exposed. Uh, the additional detail you can see at either end in the bounce chambers are the linear motion encoders, uh, which provide information to both to the ECU and to our power and motion control about exactly where the pistons are. Uh, I'm going to keep quiet on the next slide because I think here's a, uh, an animation, sorry, a video of the engine uh, motoring in our lab, uh, and you'll just be able to hear the pitch of the two different operating points that uh, this test demonstrates. So um, we're going to push a, a couple of polls to the audience during this presentation. And the first one uh, is really inviting you to uh, give me some feedback on where you think uh, the most important advantages of an opposed free piston, arch a, a opposed free piston engine architecture might be. And those advantages could be, for example, in the efficiency. Now, opposed piston engines generally are more efficient because you don't have the heat losses through the head. Uh, but there are also additional efficiency levers that come from opposed free piston. Um, uh, secondly, uh, we can use the free piston motion to uh, adapt compression ratio to make better use of renewable alcohol fuels. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, reducing the cost of emissions compliance, you know, reducing the, uh, the emissions uh, certainly compared to existing two strokes. And uh, the intention is to reduce the emissions and the cost of emissions compliance significantly below the cost for conventional crank en cranked engine because the variable compression ratio can be used as a calibration parameter. Uh, low vibration is another interesting piece. We put a video onto YouTube uh, showing a coin balance on top of an engine uh, running uh, in the lab along the lines of the video that I showed you. Um, the size and the shape is quite interesting as well. It's possible to make engines that have a very small uh, sort of one, you know, the, the height of the engine in the case of our lab engine is only a couple hundred millimeters. And so being able to package a, a power generator pack in that very low profile uh, presents some interesting opportunities. Uh, and then finally, uh, both compared to conventional engines and also compared to fuel cells and other uh, uh, methods for power generation, a free piston engine can start up uh, very quickly. So rather than having to crank back and forth over and over, uh, the, there's potential for a free piston engine to move from a standing start through to first firing uh, in the space of a couple of strokes, maybe a couple of hundred milliseconds. So fast startup might be another um, another interesting advantage. So I'll let you mull on those as I talk through uh, some of the specifics and, and we'll come back to the poll results uh, later in the presentation. So just on efficiency, um, to frame this point, I want to highlight uh, what we call a motion profile. So this plot shows on the vertical axis piston uh, piston velocity and the horizontal axis is piston position going back and forth more or less about the midpoint. So uh, as, as you can imagine, um, during a test, the uh, the position of the uh, each piston might be represented by a point on here that orbits uh, clockwise around the, uh, the, the axis origins. Um, and the shape of this motion profile uh, is not quite elliptical. Uh, it's sort of more like a bit of a potato. If we compare that to uh, what a cranked engine might look like, so the black line on here is a, a cranked engine with a bit of a conrod that means it's more like an egg shape. Uh, and the difference between that egg shape of a conventional cranked engine and the, the sort of blunt potato shape of a, an opposed free piston engine uh, impacts efficiency in two ways. 
So firstly, uh, it's a fairly subtle difference, but you'll see around top dead center here, positive 60 millimeters. Um, the, the very rapid deceleration and acceleration away from top dead center means a, f a free piston engine is spending less time at those super hot conditions where a lot of the heat loss occurs. Secondly, you'll also notice that mid-stroke, the peak velocities are slightly lower than in a conventional engine. Uh, so that reduces the uh, potential friction cost of motoring the cycle. Um, there's also a further friction benefit, uh, which is unrelated to this, which comes as a result of using gas bearings in a free piston engine. Uh, so the motion profile there, I think, tells a story. If we look at the benefit of opposed free piston uh, on the right hand side, what I've done here is just calculated through that cycle what the gas pressure might be if we were motoring and therefore what the gas temperature might be if we assumed a, uh, an ideal adiabatic compression expansion event and then looked at summing up uh, the area during that, uh, during that process and the temperature over the time. And that area time temperature integral is reduced by over 35% with the opposed free piston engine format compared to a cranked internal combustion engine format. Uh, and it's a fairly crude comparison, but it shows the scale of the potential benefits, uh, which is why I don't think it's an exaggeration to say there could be a potential 30 to 40% reduction in thermal and friction losses with an opposed free piston engine architecture compared to a, con a conventional engine architecture. The second source of efficiency benefits uh, is a bit more subtle, but comes from the, uh, the one of the challenges with, with a, a free piston engine is we can't produce torque. We can only produce uh, electrical power. And so in, uh, in, there's never a, a situation where the engine speed is governed by something externally, like you know, the road speed or, or the, the gearing that we're using to connect to something. Instead, uh, the engine speed is a, essentially an outcome of the operating point that we choose and the operating points can therefore be very sharply optimized around specific requirements. And what I've illustrated on the left-hand side here is a four operating point engine uh, calibration where uh, point one is just off but ready to start. Point two might be, for example, low noise, low vibration operating point. Uh, point three might be a peak efficiency operating point. So that might be a sort of lean uh, HCCI type operating point. And point four might be uh, sort of a stoichiometric peak power operating point. And each one of those might be a sharply optimized operating point without the need to uh, compromise the operation for uh, the ability to uh, follow load around a map. Um, and for that reason, the sharpness of the uh, calibration optimization uh, allows the use of the compression ratio calibration parameter to be to taken full advantage of. And that's not a parameter that conventional engines have available to them. Um, we can also use compression ratio calibration to uh, calibrate for optimized transient performance. So what I've illustrated on the right-hand side here is how a cold transient might be calibrated in order to dial out some of the, uh, the, the misfiring that you would typically get with a cold start, just whilst there's, in the first few strokes, an awful lot of heat loss to the walls. And that's something we'll be investigating on the test cell in the course of the, uh, of the uh, coming weeks. Uh, with our existing intelligent platform. Um, renewable fuels compatibility is also uh, a, I've identified it as a separate benefit, but actually it's connected. Um, my background has, has sort of given me quite a lot of information and uh, enthusiasm for bioethanol, uh, which can be produced from starch crops, from grasses, from biomass. Um, very similar fuel, methanol, can be produced via gasification from biomass, and it can also be synthesized using excess renewable power. Now, both of these molecules have really good knock resistance, uh, and there's even potential to meet stringent emissions regulation requirements without after-treatment. But the downside is there's potential uh, at cold start to, to misfire, um, and that's because of the high heat of vaporization of these molecules, and also because uh, there's not a sort of a, a, a range of different molecular lengths. You know, when you have uh, ethanol as a pure fuel, that's all you've got. And so that gives a, a very uh, tight dependency on the combustion conditions, and it either goes or it doesn't. Now, an opposed free piston engine's variable compression ratio could optimize efficiency uh, for ethanol methanol blends or for just for ethanol or ethanol gasoline blends. And it could also help to improve that uh, cold start performance, as I mentioned. Um, other renewable fuel options include things like ammonia, 
Uh, and ammonia can also be synthesized from renewable power. Um, it's like ethanol and methanol has good knock resistance, but the, uh, the, the combustion features of this molecule mean that it doesn't work especially well in a crank-based engine. Um, so again, a, a, the motion profile of an opposed free piston engine could really help that. Uh, and in particular, having a non-sinusoidal motion profile uh, that uh, spends more time uh, right at TDC and then accelerates very rapidly away from TDC once the combustion is done, that could support uh, improved ammonia combustion. Uh, finally, gaseous fuels like biogas, uh, which can be produced from food wastes, uh, from soft biomass, um, syngas, uh, which can be produced via gasification. Uh, both of these types of renewable gas fuels are blends, and the calorific value and the combustion qualities therefore depend, in, in the case of biogas, on exactly how much methane and carbon dioxide there is in the blend, and that just changes over the course of a day and over the course of uh, weeks as the feedstock changes and the, the digestion conditions changes. And similarly with syngas, the, uh, the output blend depends on the input and the process conditions. So an opposed free piston engine could adapt to that varying fuel composition and make the best uh, combustion event each cycle according to the fuel quality that it's seeing. And this is something which is really not easy to do with a, a conventional cranked engine. So, um, let me now move on to talk about the uh, setup that we have on the test cell. So this is actually shown in a Marla Powertrain test cell in Northampton. And I want to talk through the performance of the, uh, of the engine uh, and the performance requirements of the platform in order to achieve a good, uh, reliable basis for combustion development. Now, what we're aiming to do in this program is a sort of three-step demonstration Firstly, we want to demonstrate that if we run with a constant compression ratio, we get similar results to if we had a crankshaft with a constant compression ratio. And uh, we're going to use wet bioethanol as the uh, sample fuel. Wet bioethanol is a, a good example of a low greenhouse gas renewable fuel. Uh, we're using the wet version of ethanol because uh, it takes less energy to produce. And so we get slightly better greenhouse gas uh, performance uh, with this in this particular example. It also has uh, some challenges when it comes to cold start. Uh, now, we're going to demonstrate those challenges at cold start by simply you know, not heating the internal combustion section of the machine. And again, demonstrate if we start with a constant compression ratio of about 14 to 1, uh, we, sh we would expect to see a fairly significant amount of misfiring. And then finally, the third step here is uh, when we cold start, but now we slide the compression ratio down from a relatively high value, maybe 18 to 1, down to a running value of 14 to 1 over the course of the first uh, few seconds or, or a few tens of seconds of operation, we want to demonstrate that we improve misfiring. And this will demonstrate uh, that we not only have control of the compression ratio, but that we can use that control to, uh, to achieve some, some desirable outcome. And what this requires of the IntelliGen platform, I've uh, put on this same chart. So. Uh, we, we're using the Marla Flexible ECU as the combustion control platform, and we therefore need to interface with that ECU so that uh, the fuel and spark can be issued at the right time. Uh, we also obviously need to uh, control the compression ratio as if we're a crankshaft for this first step. So we need to make sure that we have uh, really tight control cycle by cycle right on the target compression ratio. Um, just moving down, so the next point when we're doing cold start constant compression ratio, there will be a lot of misfiring here, um, as we expect from the literature, and therefore we need to maintain tight control of compression ratio, whether there's a misfire or not. And this is one of the key challenges, which has really uh, put the brakes on free piston engine development in previous programs. If there are combustion variations, and those variations produce further variations in compression ratio, then the system is unstable. And so this second point uh, will allow us to demonstrate that we have control stability because whether we misfire or not, we maintain the target compression ratio. Uh, and then the third requirement is that we should have the ability to slide through a range of compression ratios when we cold start, uh, which is a, uh, a sort of sequencing uh, challenge for our control um, platform. But really, if the first two problems are solved, uh, then this is uh, the, the least challenging but the most valuable step. Now, just on the control interface, what I've highlighted 
here is uh, the various things that are happening inside our blue cabinet, uh, which sits beneath the Marla Flexible ECU, uh, which is issuing uh, uh, instructions uh, and is issuing triggers for uh, Spark and Fuel. So in this case, we're not accepting uh, instructions concerning the compression ratio. We'll simply uh, select a compression ratio or sequence a series of compression ratios. But what we are doing inside this controller uh, is adapting the motion for each of the two sides of the machine uh, in order to keep them synchronized and to make sure that cycle by cycle, uh, something we call the in-stroke controller, uh, which does its job over and again uh, to follow the profile on each, on each cycle, we need to make sure that in-stroke controller uh, is operating quickly enough and uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the tightness of control, uh, but that can also accept new instructions at the next cycle from the next profile uh, controller, the next profile adapt. Uh, box I've shown on here in response to um, synchronization inputs or other inputs that require a different compression ratio. Uh, when we interface, apologies, this is a slightly uh, weak line to be showing, but what I've illustrated here is because the ECU we're interfacing with is configured to read a crank signal, we need to pretend we have a crankshaft. Uh, and to do that, we map a pulse train signal uh, onto our position signal, and then we export that. So uh, what I've shown on the top of this plot are a series of individual strokes. Um, the stroke counter is the third line down. Uh, the top two are the positions from the two uh, electrical machine movers. So you can see they're basically synchronized. And then on the bottom is a simulated pulse train, uh, which in this case, I think is uh, done as a 60 minus three. Uh, what you'll see is around bottom dead center, there's a bit of stretching and a bit of bunching. And the reason for that is with a, uh, with a free piston mover, the end of stroke has some uncertainty in it, not a huge amount of uncertainty, you know, a few hundred microns, but if there were intended to be pulses there and we short stroke, we need to fit those missing strokes in. And so in the construction of our uh, ECU pulse train, we need to make sure that the way that we feed in those additional makeup pulses, if they're required, uh, doesn't uh, sort of, uh, we, we need to make sure that's compatible with the ECU's expectations about, you know, how quickly the pulse width uh, in the signal uh, pulse train changes. So given the requirements of the platform, uh, we've established a number of key performance indicators that we keep close tabs on and we need to uh, uh, meet uh, threshold values for in order to successfully run these tests. And there are four ones I want to highlight here. So firstly, control, which we quantify as uh, the coefficient of variation of compression ratio. That means the standard deviation of compression ratios in consecutive cycles divided by the mean compression ratio. And we're targeting a fairly tight value for that, as you'd expect. Um, the second and third are, are what we call control margins. I'll, I'll describe those in a bit more detail. But essentially, throughout the cycle, we need to make sure that we always have the ability to turn up the force on the electrical machine if we need to. Because if we're maxed out on force, we no longer have control. So the control margin, the current demand margin, <clears throat> is essentially there to make sure that we can either accelerate or decelerate the electrical uh, machine mover at any point in the cycle. And, uh, and because of that margin, we can maintain control. And then finally, convergence, uh, it, which is really a measure of the speed of uh, the uh, sort of system response. We want to, uh, once we've converged on a target compression ratio, we want to maintain the compression ratio over the course of 50 or so cycles uh, at a constant compression ratio with very little slope, even if there are disturbances. So, you know, if you had a disturbance uh, and it took us 50 cycles to recover, you'd have a trend over that 50 cycle uh, sample, uh, which would appear here as a, um, as a not having met our convergence test. Uh, so, just to look briefly at the um, some sample results here. So we, we uh, are, the terminology here uh, tells us its own story. So uh, the test phase COPS I've shown on the left hand side is a control parameter set. Um, so a control parameter set is a motion profile and a set of gains, which together uh, characterize what the in-stroke controller is trying to do. Uh, and we can then measure against each of these KPIs whether we're, whether we're within uh, threshold. So I'm not going to dwell on the individual line items here other than to show that over the course of these series of, uh, of tests uh, with different COPs and with um, some other changes uh, alongside, 
we gradually improve the performance until eventually we end up with all green, which shows that we've got the means to uh, design our uh, control uh, parameters, our, our profiles and our gains. We've got the means to design these and tweak these and tune these in order to achieve a desired outcome. In this case, uh, the greens meeting all of our uh, control KPIs. Now, how we do that uh, is as follows. Firstly, we have a fairly simple parametric uh, uh, tool for generating profiles. Essentially, you know, you're starting with a something that looks a bit like an ellipse, and then we tease it and pull it around so that it looks more like a potato. And uh, we do that together with various other um, parameters uh, for when we move from the positive stroke to the negative stroke and so on. Uh, and that profile then becomes the starting point for the, uh, for the test and the uh, optimization. So test validation involves pushing the, uh, the, the COPS, uh, that profile and those gains through the machine. Uh, we also then simulate uh, the results and we check that the simulation matches the test results. Uh, which we reduce through data analysis to express just in terms of the KPIs and some of the uh, surrounding parameters that influence the KPIs. Um, the simulation approach we take is is actually fairly simple because a free piston engine is a linear system, so we can uh, simulate this as a 1D system where we uh, treat the acceleration as um, the output of the simulation in response to all of the forces acting on the moving masses. And there are only gas forces, friction forces, and uh, e-machine forces. So that 1D simulation uh, ends up being a fairly simple model, uh, but it still has some, uh, some uh, tricks necessary to get a full alignment with what's actually happening in the, on the machine over the course of a, a, a series of tests. Uh, we then use the data analysis and the 1D uh, model fit and optimization to tune the profile and tune the gain set until we get our KPIs bang on target. So looking first at the compression ratio coefficient of variation here, um, what I've plotted here just for illustration is what the top dead center positions are for the two machines. So I'm calling the left hand side here uh, encoder zero and the right hand side encoder one. Uh, and you can see the the control of the TDC positions, uh, it's, very, it's moving around a bit, right? So you can see if we're targeting, in this particular case, 60 millimeters, uh, on the left-hand side, we start maybe you know uh, 200 microns short, and we end up maybe 200 microns long. And it doesn't sound like much, but that's quite a significant impact in terms of compression ratio. However, uh, what you'll also note is if we put those two plots together, uh, because with an opposed free piston system, we don't care so much about where the individual mover stops. We care about how much space there is between them. If we put those two plots together, what you'll see is the range of results is sliding up and down this top left to bottom right diagonal. That's a constant compression ratio diagonal very tightly. In other words, although there is some variability in exactly where the TDC positions are, there's very little variability in the compression ratio. And this is a useful feature of an opposed free piston system, uh, which is that uh, the variability in the compression ratio is generally less than the variability in the motion of each individual mover. Uh, to illustrate that, I think we can see here uh, on a expanded axis, the compression ratio, which is in this case, uh, apologies for the axis, this is varying between about 12.85 and 12.95. Uh, the mean is 12.82, uh, which is the target, and the standard deviation uh, is 0.15% of the mean. So this is a reasonably good and tight illustration of uh, compression ratio coefficient of variation control. Now on control margin, uh, the so this is the next pair of KPIs. One of the key things to bear in mind is the e-machines are not infinitely large. And although it would be possible to do pretty much anything you like in combustion if you could make huge e-machines, in practice, any future economic free piston engine uh, is going to have to have economically sized e-machines. And therefore, uh, making best use of the force available and making sure that force is enough uh, is, uh, is part of the game. Now, the e-machines we have in the Intelligent platform are capable steady state of generating about three kilonewtons. And instantaneously, we can up that you know, for parts of the cycle to maybe 10 kilonewtons. Uh, sadly, the compression uh, and the combustion event produce forces that are well in excess of that. Uh, and this means that essentially the acceleration away from top dead center is largely governed by gas forces rather than by the e-machine. In other words, when we design a motion profile, we need to make sure that motion profile is 
uh, is derived from uh, a, a the gas forces, the expected gas forces, and is within the capability of the e-machine. Uh, we cannot deterministically control where the piston is going to be independently of the gas forces. Uh, we have to respect the gas forces and design a profile which is compatible with that. And the two control margins that we use for that, I've illustrated here on this plot uh, versus position. So again, this is the same position domain plot on the horizontal axis. Um, and on the vertical axis, we've got current. So uh, the drives that we use, we can run um, 40 amps RMS for about a minute, uh, and we can max out at 120 amps for not very long at all. So we better make sure that when we're running a cycle, the RMS current is within that 40 amp limit, and the, uh, the peak current never maxes out beyond 120 amps. Uh, and in the case of the control margin one, the RMS control margin, you can see in this particular test case, 2192, uh, that is that is so. So the RMS current there was 33 amps, uh, and we have a bit of margin before we get to 40 amps. So we can tick that box. Uh, and then secondly, if we look at the the closest that the maximum current gets to 120 amps, positive or negative, I've illustrated here, and that maxed out at something like 65 amps, so leaving as a fair margin in this particular case to the 120 amps. Uh, bear in mind, these are motored tests, so this is just for illustration of the terminology. Uh, when we move into combustion tests, this particular margin will actually get better rather than worse, because uh, what's illustrated here at that point where we're motoring away from top dead center, uh, we're motoring because there is no combustion. When mo when combustion happens, then uh, life gets a bit easier for the e-machines, and uh, that control margin grows. Now, convergence, uh, I can illustrate best with this plot. So previously, I showed you the plot uh, on the left of this slide with uh, quite a lot of, you know, very uh, sorry, very tight precision of the. Uh, uh, compre compression ratio control as we slide up and down that diagonal. But if we look further back in that test, the first uh, about the first 100 cycles, the compression ratio was gradually tracking down and then was converged after 100 cycles and following convergence has a very small drift rate. So on the right hand side, you can see the compression ratio trend tracking down. And then once we're converged, the compression ratio remains uh, pretty tightly controlled. Um, the speed at which we achieve that converged point and then the trend once we're at convergence, those are also uh, things that we can, uh, we can control and tune. Uh, but these plots I quite like because they illustrate that process. Um, so looking ahead then, uh, I've talked about some of the things we have done and how we've, we've tried to uh, focus on the KPIs that are necessary in order to achieve a good, stable and robust combustion development platform. Looking ahead, there's a number of things that we'll be uh, turning our attention to in the course of 2021. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll just quickly walk through those. So power density is going to be a key factor. Um, Interestingly, with an opposed free piston engine, you get power density uh, pretty much on demand simply by raising the pressure of the of the bounce chambers that allows you to uh, to increase the, the spring rate and uh, the uh, the speed at which you can turn around, and that drives operating frequency. So we'll be doing some further work there to see how high we can go. Uh, we will be looking at efficiency, and in particular, the bounce chamber efficiency. You know, the bounce chambers are not uh, uh, you know, there, is, there are losses associated with the gas compression and expansion, uh, both from thermal losses and from blow-by. And so there's some work to do there to make sure that we minimize those losses. And similarly, uh, we can minimize friction losses by switching to air bearings rather than the, uh, the current dry bearings. Um, we've got various developments underway that will allow us to drive down the manufactured cost, both for uh, the cost of development systems and also in the fullness of time for production systems that arise at the end of the development journey. Uh, from our clients. Uh, combustion developments, uh, whilst not uh, the focus for us, uh, will support uh, combustion developments, uh, which can include, for example, pre-chamber technologies to enhance completeness and speed of combustion. One of the challenges in a, an opposed free piston engine is uh, the, the conventional engines, uh, sort of tumble in particular, you don't get with a free piston engine. So that can impact uh, the, the type of combustion and the completeness of combustion that you get at the end of, uh, at the end of a certain period of time. Uh, similarly, scavenging, uh, whilst this is not part of our core technology set, uh, we will be supporting enhancements to port design and uh, uh, scavenging architecture over the course of the next few months. Um, sealing will be a key a key factor here. Um, I think at the moment we're using a fairly conventional ring pack, 
uh, there's potential to uh, to go to alternate sealing technologies uh, and potentially uh, oil-free sealing, which would have uh, great upside in terms of uh, maintenance. Uh, but there's some development to to go through there. Um, and then finally, thermal uh, development in particular with an opposed piston system. The exhaust temp uh, the exhaust piston has a fairly hard life because it just sees combustion and then exhaust over and over. Um, and uh, you know, if you don't have the ability to spray uh, oil jets onto that exhaust piston, you need to take the heat away through other means. Uh, so that is a, a fairly you know useful shopping list of the things we'll be turning our attention to. At this stage, though, I think we are uh, pretty confident in the performance of the platform and the control of the platform, which breaks the back of one of the key challenges to accelerated free piston engine development. Now, um, just before I close, our, our business uh, is, as I've mentioned, a, we're, we're a developer of platform systems, but we don't make engines. Uh, we, we've put a reference internal combustion system between our e-machines to demonstrate the performance of our platform, but ultimately products that will be brought to market uh, will be developed not by us but by, by our partners and, and, uh, and customers uh, and therefore we're always uh, interested to find out where the uh, the, uh, the first applications might be. Uh, in the UK there's uh, clearly a move away from uh, combustion technology development for passenger automotive but there are other applications uh, where combustion and renewable fuels uh, can be anticipated to play a significant role for some time to come. So the second poll, uh, which we'll take a look at uh, during the Q&A session, uh, asks for your input on where you think the, the first applications might be. So uh, some examples here, heavy duty vehicles. Uh, so, you know, trucks driving long distances uh, that where battery electrification might have a really challenging impact on the payload and operator economics. There might be a role there for range extended, uh, range extension using renewable fuels. Uh, distributed power generation for us certainly is generating a lot of interest at the moment. Uh, auxiliary power generation uh, alongside a, uh, a, a prime mover. Uh, Off-highway, uh, and that off-highway application can be split into construction, agriculture, mining, and forestry. So as we move into the Q&A, uh, give that some thought, and then we'll look at the results before the end of the session. So I think I'm just inside of 40 minutes. Let me hand over to David and we'll see if there are any questions, uh, which I'll be very happy to take. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. That was a really interesting uh, presentation on your technology. And uh, yeah, it's good to see it running. Well, almost running, isn't it, Sam? In, uh, yes. Our, our yeah, yeah. On our test bed. <laughs> I don't know whether I've got to today, but um, it's certainly uh, it yes, makes noise yesterday. Uh, it, it did, yeah. No, we're uh, we're very happy with progress though so far. It's uh, it's always challenging operating when you know through lockdown and uh, and and you know in the run up to Christmas. But uh, no, it's been a it's been a great journey, and uh, uh, we've got some really exciting results so far. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really good. So yeah, there have been some questions from you. So thank you for that. Um, so I'll just look look down. So first question here was um, how reliable are free piston engines, and how long will they last? The question here says the benefits are clear, but can they match the million mile engines, which is typical for heavy duty, which is what you were alluding to just now, Sam, I think. But that might be one of the sure. So, yes. Yeah, so, so I think the um, it, I, I, it's a difficult question to answer in part because there aren't many examples of free piston engines out there. So historically, free piston engines have been used, for example, in air compressors. I think there was a Junkers uh, opposed piston air compressor that, that was in use uh, uh, for a long while. Um, I think part of the question about reliability is just, you know, cumulatively, there haven't been that many free piston engines made, and therefore they haven't had the attention applied to them to drive up that very long-term efficiency. Uh, sorry, that very long-term durability. Um, if we look at the, the source, you know, the potential failure modes and uh, how, you know, wh where that might uh, drive expectations for durability, well, an opposed free piston engine doesn't have a valve train, so there's a lot of component complexity that immediately comes out. Um, if uh, an engine can be developed running on gas bearings, so it doesn't have uh, oil change intervals, that's potentially another source of uh, life extension uh, and uh, reducing the opera uh, operation maintenance intervals. Uh, I think that's not without its challenges because I think an oil-free 
ring pack is something that hasn't been uh, implemented in a combustion engine or uh, oil-free compressors out there, uh, but it's the marrying together of some existing technologies, existing solutions from oil-free compressors, for example, to make oil-free uh, opposed free piston engines, which I think offers the best potential. Um, I think the another way to look at that is uh, if we look out, you know, at, out in the uh, beyond Libertine, who else is out there making free piston engines? Uh, the uh, uh, the company in California, uh, Mainspring, used to be called Etagen, I think are very close to market with uh, a free piston engine product, uh, which will be generating power in distributed power gen applications, uh, 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 slightly larger scale. Uh, but in their case, uh, many of the things we're describing here are, are put into practice. And it'll be very interesting to see in the coming months as, uh, as, as that development reaches its conclusion and commercialization. I think some of those questions about uh, real world reliability will be answered. Yeah, and I guess there's a fundamental difference here that it, it, it's not actually the main, it, it's not driving the wheels, is it? it, it it's effectively a, a, a generation, a generator. In, in, in yeah, that's right. So, and, and I, I think um, there's two, two additional aspects to that which are quite important. Firstly, because the pistons are moving in individual cylinders which aren't coupled directly together, it's possible to construct engine architectures in which you have parallel redundancy. In other words, you can make a six cylinder engine and if you want to take one of the cylinders offline, you can deactivate that and have a five cylinder engine whose balance is exactly the same as the original six cylinder version. So that parallel redundancy, I think, potentially drives some, uh, some uh, additional uptime availability and uh, drives some additional uh, reliability. Um, I think the other aspect is the information we get back of our electrical machines tells a story about the status of the seals of the, uh, the you know, the, the one dimensional performance of the electrical machines and so on. And that can be processed into diagnostic information that can inform predictive maintenance. And I think as a consequence, both of the parallel redundancy and of the opportunities for predictive maintenance, there's a really exciting angle here for uh, the, an argument for opposed free piston engines just on the basis of uptime, durability, availability over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, isn't it? Okay, uh, next question, sort of, sort of related to some of that, Sam, is uh, you mentioned frictional and thermal efficiency being sort of 30 to 40% better than a traditional engine. Um, were you referring to an opposed piston traditional engine or a normal inline or V engine? No, so the, the reference I was making there was with a, uh, a, a single uh, cylinder uh, of a conventional engine. Um, so much of the, uh, the the geometry benefit that you get in an opposed piston engine uh, carries across. Yes, so of course, it is possible to conceive of a, a very efficient opposed piston engine. There are companies like Akatis out there making uh, great headway into uh, sort of this new engine architecture, uh, opposed DI two-stroke architecture. Um, the attraction of putting free piston on top of that, essentially replacing the crankshafts, uh, is you get some additional efficiency as a result of the, the, the kind of the second order benefits that I described earlier on, the ability to do HCCI, for example, to stabilize that using real-time compression ratio control, uh, the ability to do uh, uh, sort of active uh, transients to uh, improve efficiency as during starts and stops, and also the additional efficiency by expanding more rapidly away from top dead center. So those benefits qualitatively are in addition to the very substantial benefits of opposed piston. And in the opposed piston architecture, uh, there are also packaging benefits if you can take away the crankshafts and do that job with uh, linear electrical machines. Uh, thanks, Sam. <clears throat> um, so one of the other questions here. So there was a, there was a question. Oh, my screen's decided to freeze. <laughs> so there's a question uh, relating to the efficiency uh, and sort of harking back to the uh, the heavy duty, I guess, application was how does the efficiency of a free piston engine compare to that of a fuel cell? Uh, it's a it's a great question, and I think the it, it all depends. If that isn't too uh, too easily, it depends on what's the fuel, uh, what losses are associated with converting the fuel into the thing that the fuel cell burns. So you know, so if you have a a, a solid oxide fuel cell which is going to run off 
uh, hydrogen that has to be reformed from uh, from natural gas or a PEM fuel cell, where the hydrogen is re is reformed from a uh, uh, from a, a you know another fuel, whether it's natural gas or renewable gas or methanol or something. It's the overall system losses that you care about. Now, um, the efficiency of a free piston engine at the sort of scale we're talking about. So our technology we think will be applicable in individual cylinders up to maybe 60 to 80 kilowatt scale, and then multiplied up. For an individual 60 kilowatt engine, uh, achieving a, if an efficiency from fuel to electrical power output in the region of 45 to 50 percent, um, I'm guessing there are probably fuel cell implementations that will that will be there or thereabouts, and in some cases maybe slightly better than that. The um, so I, I think we would argue a, a, a good efficiency optimized free piston engine can be close to the mark, close to the bar set by a fuel cell. Uh, but of course, some of the challenges with fuel cells, for example, being able to start up very quickly, being sensitive to vibration in the environment, being sensitive to dust and other sort of you know, it, uh, environmental uh, uh, factors like that, and also the fuel flexibility, being able to use liquid fuels, those might be reasons why in certain applications, a free piston engine is the best is, is the better solution, uh, but I don't argue at all that there will be no fuel cells. I think it's more a question of finding the right technology for the right application and a, an, an acknowledgement that there are going to be a diversity of fuels, a diversity of application requirements, and therefore a diversity of technology fits. That's really uh, why I'm so excited about free piston engines, because I think there are some applications where uh, those points of difference justify the, uh, justify the development. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's a viewpoint we share at Marla Power Train as well. It's the right fit for the application. A <clears throat> um, bit more of a technical question here, Sam. Was, um, how does the variability in the individual pistons affect the in-cylinder mixing? Uh, so it's a good question, and uh, the truthful answer is I don't know because we we haven't done ourselves. We haven't done combustion simulation, and there will be plenty of that to come. Uh, we do know that in in the literature, when people have looked at um, charge motion and scavenging processes in opposed piston engines, the uniflow scavenged approach that we have in our reference combustion architecture looks pretty good. So uh, I know there's been work done on that, in particular at Bath University, um, and. Uh, for that reason, you know, I think starting with a, a, an opposed free piston uniflow scavenged architecture is not a bad place to start. But I, you know, I don't shy away from the fact that uh, the the people using our platform will want to get into the detail of uh, port design, of uh, in cylinder charge motion. You know, how much swirl you want to introduce, whether there's possibility of uh, of squish at the top and, and other forms of charge motion uh, made possible by um, uh, pre chambers and so on. All of that good stuff is right out there, and there for the taking from companies that are ready to step up and uh, and put the put the work in to optimise free piston engines on this platform. Yeah, it will be interesting, and we'll be with you on that journey as well. I think Sam, aren't we? <laughs> Absolutely. The, uh, the, the detail combustion side of it is going to be an interesting project. Um, another question here was um, how is the cooling and lubrication solved in this engine design? I'm around the combustion so, chamber, I guess, the main question there. Yes, yeah, so in the reference uh, platform we have, uh, we have multiple cooling loops. So the um, the e-machines are cooled and we flow coolant in and the ends and out in the middle. So typically there will be a temperature gradient down the e-machines. We allow the center of the e-machine, uh, sort of the, the central part of the uh, uh, engine to get a bit hotter than the outsides. And we also have an independent coolant loop on for the internal combustion system. Uh, that's largely a convenience for development because we want to be able to show uh, you know, cold start, hot start, and move the combustion system temperature up and down uh, for the purposes of development. In a production engine, I think we would expect uh, the coolant uh, flows would be uh, designed to be consistent with the coolant available in that application. So in a, for example, in a heavy duty vehicle, vehicle powertrain application, we would probably look to have the, a similar cooling environment to uh, the uh, battery modules and power electronics who share some of the same temperature constraints. Uh, we wouldn't look to anchor our e-machine temperatures and coolant loops to the combustion systems, which can typically tolerate something higher than that. Uh, but those considerations, you're right, you know, thermal considerations are everything because uh, you can only drive your e-machines as hard as the, uh, as, as the thermal limitations will allow. So, uh, yeah, cooling and power density go hand in hand. And, and how about the lubrication then for the seals and so forth? 
<clears throat> so lubrication uh, for us is mostly about keeping the uh, keeping the ring pack sufficiently lubricated. Uh, we don't have a sump. We don't have um, uh, you know a, a reservoir of recirculating oil. Uh, in the development platform, we have a, a essentially a total loss system. So it, you know once every few thousand. Uh, strokes once every, once every few thousand cycles, we might introduce you know a fraction of a cc of, of oil, uh, but the uh, the oil consumption is really very low. So as long as nothing uh, runs dry, then from the development perspective, uh, it's you know it's a kind of secondary issue. I think in a production engine, um, there could be a, a sumped and recirculating oil system. Uh, there could be a, a design for an oil-free system. And again, I think that comes down to the preference of the developer and the application requirements of the intended target application and uh, so you know I think as far as the internal combustion systems lubrication is concerned that is an application development question uh, as far as our uh, e-machines are concerned our move next year will be towards putting gas bearings uh, on all of our e-machines again that's very uh, consistent with the approach of having uh, you know, elevated pressures in the bounce chamber. So, you know, having our e-machines independent of any lubrication strategy on the internal combustion systems, I think, gives a bit more flexibility for the uh, for the combustion guys. Yeah, no, very interesting. Yeah. Um, there's a few more questions, Sam. <laughs> uh, how does the power yes, to weight ratio? <laughs> yeah. How does the power to weight ratio compare to that of a conventional cranked engine, and what range of horsepower? do you expect to obtain from these units? So I think the, yeah, it's, again, it's a really good question. Uh, and I, my, my gut feel is that the power density is probably not going to be quite at the level of a, you know, highly rated internal combustion engine. If you look at the, the sort of, uh, you know, high boost uh, rotating internal combustion engines, uh, you know, horsepower per liter, I don't think we'll get to that sort of level. And that's in part because the limitations imposed by the moving mass, our moving mass has to stop twice every single cycle, and it's only the bounce chambers that are helping to do that. So, um, you know, I think there are other combustion architectures uh, that can uh, eliminate that constraint. Essentially, opposed combustion architectures where you've got combustion pushing you back and forth rather than the bounce chambers. Uh, and I think opposed combustion architectures can meet or exceed the expectations for uh, power density. Uh, there's some work from Newcastle now at Durham University that uh, points to that. Uh, we also know of work uh, at Aquarius Engines that also points to potentially very high power density applications. So uh, yes, I think there are combustion architectures that focus on power density. Um, our, the IntelliGen architecture, which is an opposed piston rather than opposed combustion architecture uh, is prioritizing uh, efficiency and control over power density. Uh, and that's not to say that the same uh, approach, the same control platform approach couldn't be used in both. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, sort of linked to that is how quickly can the load be varied with, with, with that system? So uh, the, the, in terms of the energy recovery, our, our e-machines uh, are uh, you know, they, they generate and they motor uh, with uh, complete equivalence throughout the stroke. So uh, if you had a misfire, for example, uh, then the e-machines will be motoring. And if you uh, were firing as expected, they'd be generating. And everything in between, um, that, you know, that switchover takes place in milliseconds or fractions of milliseconds. Um, in terms of how quickly can you move between operating points, so on my operating point map, if you if you were running at an HCCI operating point, and then you had a request from the powertrain control unit to switch to a maximum power operating point. Uh, I think that is more likely to be constrained by how long it takes the you know the air to spool up, uh, rather than how long it takes the, uh, the the pistons to change their compression ratio. Because uh, you know one stroke is uh, you know uh, ten or twenty milliseconds, and that's all it takes to move from sixteen to one compression ratio to fourteen to one compression ratio in the work we're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we're going down to the last few questions here, Sam. Um, what is the expected overall efficiency power out over fuel energy in? So again, I think it depends on the uh, fuel. It depends on the uh, other constraints to operation. But in the the, the sort of the Sankey diagrams that we've uh, looked at so far, we would expect at about the sort of forty to sixty kilowatt cylinder scale, we would expect an efficiency um, in the region of. Uh, 40 to 45% in early products and 45 to 50% in later products. 
uh, fully mature, uh, if you were to also include heat recovery in those later products, uh, it's entirely feasible that we could see engines uh, in excess of 50% fuel to electrical efficiency. Uh, and I think you know that would be uh, an incredible win, especially if that's achieved using renewable fuels. Yeah. Interesting question here. Can you run it in reverse as an electrically driven gas compressor? Uh, yes, uh, and in fact, we have. Uh, we've been involved in a hydrogen compressor project in the US, which was a DOE funded, a Department of Energy funded uh, project together with Southwest Research. That's in the public domain. Uh, so absolutely, and there are there are specific reasons why the ability to control the profile of the compression stroke and the suction stroke in a compressor makes the compressor much more efficient. So yes, we, you know, our, our focus as a company is on delivering the platform, delivering the control performance. Uh, and uh, although on this talk we're very much focused on internal combustion applications, yes, we've we've done exactly the same. We've taken the same approach in other applications, including uh, organic Rankine cycle expander applications, uh, hydrogen compressor applications, uh, high dynamic uh, uh, test actuator applications. Uh, so yes, we you know the 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 architecture and the technical approach does have a wide range of applications and uh, and can be employed in that way. Yeah. Yes, it's a really good technology, isn't it? For that, it's great. Um, how are you looking at? Uh, sorry, are you only looking at spark ignition, or are you looking at compression ignition as well? Uh, so I would say that's a question for the uh, you know for, for the development partner, for the end product developer. Um, from Libertine's perspective, we're agnostic about combustion method. We're agnostic about fuels. Uh, we just want to deliver the compression ratio that's needed uh, and the control response that's needed for those combustion um, schemes. Uh, so, you know, um, uh, HCCI, I think, is a particular area of interest that the uh, the very fast actuating uh, control that we have could play a role in, in helping to deliver that. And in fact, that's the focus of the company I mentioned earlier, uh, Mainspring in the US, who, um, who have uh, demonstrated HCCI using the fast actuation control of an opposed free piston architecture. Uh, so there will, of course, be other renewable fuels. There'll be uh, there'll be other combustion methods. And as I said, we're agnostic uh, to the uh, choice of fuel and the co choice of combustion uh, method. Uh, we simply provide the platform to accelerate development and make that development more cost effective and lower risk. Yeah, absolutely. So are there any free pistons? I think we're into the last questions here, really, Sam. We're running out of time now, I think. Um, are there any oh, yeah. free pistons? <laughs> Are there any free piston engines in commercial use that you know of? So if you go back over the last hundred years, people have commercialized free piston engines. Uh, free piston gas generators have been used at very large scales. I say very large scales, you know, 20 megawatt free piston gas generators have been used in uh, Sigma power stations. They've been used in, um, uh, in, in powertrains on Navy vessels. There have been various prototypes uh, for automotive and uh, and train applications. Uh, the only free piston engines that have sort of properly gone commercial at the smaller scale uh, have been in things like you know the Junkers air compressor that I mentioned. Um, uh, we also see uh, a sort of compression driven free piston hammers which probably don't really count because it doesn't matter quite so much how clean the combustion is in that case. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting technology area in that people have been investigating it for a long time. Uh, part of the reason that we haven't seen free piston engines commercialized so far is some of the technology and environment that's necessary, in particular having low cost, very efficient, very reliable power electronics. It just, they just didn't exist 20 years ago. And they, the, the advancement of power electronics that's been driven by distributed renewables is now something that enables free piston engines, as does the control technologies which are available through um, advances. I mean, we use uh, national instruments controllers, but there are many other very fast controllers and control architectures that let uh, the, the kind of the super quick FPGA type controllers interface with real time controllers. That architecture, we would have had to develop ourselves back in the 90s. And today we can just flip through a catalog and, and you know buy one for delivery next week. So there's a lot of development in the environment which makes this decade uh, almost unique in the history of free piston engines as the decade when suddenly all these things come together. Now, Libertine is a tiny company. We haven't developed all of this stuff ourselves, but we've sort of recognized the advances in the environment and we've now brought together uh, an ecosystem of technologies and an architecture that leverages those technologies uh, and um, sort of 
dished it up in a way that hopefully is going to accelerate development of new free piston engine products that take advantage of this in a fraction of the time that it would have taken in the early 2000s and in a way that simply wouldn't have been possible without orders of magnitude more development cost and effort if it had been tried in the 1980s or 90s. Yes, a very fair point. The technology has enabled it, hasn't it, in recent times. That uh, it, 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 and it's brought a lot of things. It, technology has enabled a lot of things that have tried 20, 30 years ago, hasn't it, that we can now make either productionable or cost-effective. Um, it, it, it's an exciting time for these kind of technologies, I think. Um, well, we're out of time, Sam. Uh, did you want to pass comment on the polls that have that were pushed out during the presentation? Uh, oh, uh, I, yes, I've just seen the results come in. So, well, thanks very much for those. Yes, uh, I, I trust the audience have seen the uh, the results polls. I'll be pouring over those. So thanks very much for <laughs> your response on those. Um, I, you know, I, I think overall, uh, the, the answers are fairly balanced. And I think that's a reflection of uh, both in terms of the features of a free piston engine and the uh, the technology product market fit, uh, you know, I think there is a golden opportunity in amongst the diversity of applications that need to be decarbonized uh, for innovative products being brought to market to make better use of renewable fuels. So, uh, again, thanks for your input on those two polls, and uh, thanks for your attention and uh, your interest in the presentation today. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing more of our news as we make progress on this uh, together with Marla next year. Thank you, Sam, and uh, thank you, everybody, for your attendance today. I think that brings this webinar to a close. Thank you, David.